my short time here, I've heard uh, various things, but one of them that's keep coming back to me is, is who did Providence hire that starts off with the book of Revelation? I warned you. I told you all you were crazy. But let me say this to you, church. When I look around, not just at our church, but just the church in America. We have lost our way on so many ways. We have created idolatry, sacred cows. We have tried to turn church into entertainment. We have done so many different things. And I want you to know that we have overcomplicated something simple that Jesus Christ has said the church is supposed to be. Are you with me on this? You following along? Because I'm not here to pick a battle. I'm here to teach scripture, okay? But what's so important to remember is when Christ says, this is my expectation of my church, it's not a suggestion. It's a command, amen? And when we read Revelation about the seven churches, we do this not so that we can sit here and find a way of how we are better than someone else. We are called to have a reflective heart of our own conditions. Today, we are going to be looking at a church that at that time was infamous, successful. But even Jesus looked at the heart condition of the church at Ephesus and said, you got a problem. And I'm going to tell you how to fix it. Church, this simple 
construct that Jesus reveals to John to be sent to these seven churches is an act of grace in itself. He knew what would happen that the church would lose its way a little bit. Because you do know, anytime us humans get together and do something, we, we're good at screwing it up, right? Amen? And please hear my heart when I share this with you. I'm not here to wag a finger at you. It's not my job. Please remember, I wag, if I wag a finger at you, I got three more pointing back at me. Can we all agree that we're sinners? Saved by grace? By Jesus Christ himself? He is our Lord, our Savior, and if we truly believe that, we will follow his commands. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation 2. A couple weeks ago, we read Revelation 1 together, and we see Jesus Christ standing amongst the seven lampstands, and we discussed that those lampstands that represented the seven churches are light bearers of the light of Christ. The church is the light bearer of Christ. We are not the light, we hold the light. Remember we talked about that? And Jesus has in his hand, he holds seven stars, and those seven stars represent the seven messengers, angels. The Greek word for angels is angelos, which means an English messenger. So when we look at, write this to the angel of this church, he is talking about the messenger. At that time when a letter was sent to a church, it was read out loud to the body by the messenger. So some of us in our context, we, we see, right? This is the angel, like, oh, every church has an angel. Time out. <laughs> They're talking about that who is going to read. And the letters that are written that we are going to go over today, Jesus addresses seven churches in Asia Minor, or as we know today, Turkey, modern-day Turkey. The first one that he addresses is one that is loaded. And that is the church at Ephesus. Today, Ephesus stands in rubble. That church is no more. And church, I'm going to break the news to you. I'll be that guy for a moment. I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer. But no church is built for eternity. You know that, right? One day Providence will have served its purpose but you know what's great? We're going to be with Christ himself. All right? I don't know if there will be stained glass there. I hope so, because it's beautiful, right? But I do know you won't have to worry about business meetings to change the carpet, okay? That's the good news. Jokes aside, we have to acknowledge that the church is not an eternal thing. It's a temporary thing. Now, what's interesting is, we do know that scripture calls the church the bride of Christ. So those of us people who gather in the name of Jesus to learn in his church, which is not a building, it is the people, are called to conduct our lives in a way that reflects a tight, close-knit relationship with Jesus himself. That's nothing to be afraid of, by the way. That's an honor and a privilege bestowed upon us. So let us go to his word and learn that. By now you should be in Revelation 2. And we're going to be reading verses 1 through 7. This is what Jesus, if you have read letters in your Bible, it's all red. It's awesome. Jesus says this in Revelation 2, starting in verse 1. Write to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks amongst the seven lampstands, I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. I know that you have persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name and have not grown weary. But I have this against you. Underline that statement. I have this against you. That's very important. Christ gives them a compliment. <laughs> Tells them what they're doing right, but he gets real with them. I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Here's another one to underline. He gives the winning formula. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet you do have this, 
You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Pause there for a minute. If Jesus says he hates something, that's pretty serious, is it not? That's pretty evil when he, when he uses the word hate pertaining to a group. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the words that Christ reveals to us of what the church is called to do. Lord, I ask today that we open our hearts, open our minds, and as scripture says, those of us who have an ear to hear, we listen to what it is you are speaking to us. Let the words that come from my mouth be of you and the Holy Spirit, and not one of my opinion or preference. Let the Holy Spirit have an outpouring on this place, Lord, and let people have divine revelation of what it is your word says. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. It's very, very interesting to me that as Jesus is spelling out what's happening and good in this church, he quickly calls out a couple things. It's powerful to think that he looks at a church, he looks at a group of people, and he says, you have lost your first love. Many people have debated for years what that first love is. But if we actually go through scripture and look at the history of this church, it is abundantly clear. What I want you to do, you don't necessarily have to go there, I'm going to give you the Nate Varnador quick notes of it, but write somewhere in your Bible, Acts 19, Acts 19. Acts 19 discusses the birth of the church at Ephesus. This is something that's important to remember because this is an area of the world, specifically in Ephesus, where polytheism is very high, meaning that there is multiple gods being worshipped. That's not uncommon at that time, especially in that part of the world. But there was a goddess in Ephesus called Artemis that was dominant and worshipped. And Artemis had a great following, but a lot of people made money off of the worship of Artemis. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden we see this new religion pop up, requiring people to follow a guy named Jesus, who does not need idols. It is simply by faith that you receive your salvation. And all of a sudden, people start going to this new religion. And all these people who were making money off of Artemis, guess what? They get irritated. They want this new religion gone. But here's what was happening at the church at Ephesus. They were on fire for the gospel. They were reaching their neighbors. They were going to the city. They were saying, people need to know this hope. They were fired up. They were passionate you would say that they were in love. Y'all remember what it was like when you got saved? Truly on fire for Jesus. Like you. And what happens? The world wears you down, does it not? And you go from having this passionate love relationship where you're constantly pursuing more of God, wanting to know who Jesus Christ is, to all of a sudden you get complacent. And you sit back. The church at Ephesus, when the followers of Artemis we're trying to start arresting and putting them on trial. You know what they did? They were so on fire for the gospel, they started riots that were so severe, the city had to come together and say, what do we do? Neither would give way, and this is what they left with. We read in Acts 19. Again, I'm giving you the, the quick notes. Okay, you Jesus followers, you, you worry about yourself and you go do your thing. Artemis followers, stay away from them. They are not going to back down. Don't pick a fight that you don't want. The church at Ephesus would grow to a point that was so successful, Paul wrote a letter to them, Ephesians, we've read it, where they are one of the few churches he does not have a criticism about. As a matter of fact, he tells them what they should do next since they have made it to a good point. Ephesus is a very successful church and against all odds thrived in a pagan setting. Fast forward though, 
we see something. Jesus himself says, hey, remember how you guys were before? Remember how on fire you were before? No, you're on cruise control now. He, he credits them for not tolerating false teachings. History would actually reveal that the church at Ephesus did such a good job of finding who was lying and who was heretical and who was trying to infiltrate the early church to put false teachings in there. They were so good at identifying it, they almost hurt themselves. They started going down a path of legalism, meaning that they got so good at hunting down the heretics that nobody amongst the body trusts one another. They started getting caught up in these theological debates. We don't do that in church today. There's no way. No, we've advanced past that. The problem is they got so worried about the things in the church that their passion for the gospel to be the church outside of it went away. They distracted themselves. And Jesus Christ himself is like, hey guys, great job. You're good. Here's the problem. Your passion and love for me, for the gospel, for what I offer people, it's time to go back to that. It's time to go back to that. It's interesting when we have nothing and we lean into God and he reveals himself, how on fire we are because of how good he is. But then once we get to a point where we feel like, God, I got this now. Thank you for helping me get here. But I have arrived. I got it from here. It's amazing how cold we become. Amen? Or oh me. This is what Jesus is calling out. He is calling out this cold attitude that we see. And what's interesting is he addresses this in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, verses 12 through 14, he says this. Jesus says this when he's talking about the end of days. He says, because lawlessness will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. It's funny that Jesus proclaims that when he's asked about the end of days by his disciples in Matthew 24. And all of a sudden, here we are in Revelation, and he's already having to talk to the church at Ephesus, which, by the way, at this time, was doing good work. Ephesus was doing good work. He commends them. But we have to remember, Jesus knows each and every one of us differently than we know each other. Can we admit that today, church? He knows your heart. He knows the true you. And he is looking at the people at Ephesus and he's saying, you know what your problem is? You've lost your first love. I'll be celebrating my, what is it, Melissa, 17th, 18th anniversary? You're the one who's supposed to remember numbers. Okay. Look, you're, you guys are lucky I remembered it was here that long ago, okay? Um, Y'all are lucky I remember that much. Um, in marriage... You do one of two things. If you get complacent, what happens to the marriage? It's not healthy, is it? As a matter of fact, you would say it's diminishing. But if you are continuously growing in your love in that heartfelt pursuit of your marriage, the marriage is healthy, is it not? Let's go back to this. What is the church? The what of Christ? The bride. Hmm. It's almost like Jesus knew what he was using with visualization, right? <laughs> It's important for us to remember that in those days, in the end of days, we are going to see the church, we're going to see people grow cold in their love. They're not going to be church, they're going to play church. And as long as we gather and we have the things, we somehow can convince ourselves that that's good enough. And it's not. Jesus is looking back at them and actually goes, hey, remember when you guys used to love me so much that you were willing to start riots when people tried to blaspheme my name? 
But now that you've arrived, now that you've had the things, you need to repent. By the way, isn't it interesting he says that in the middle of the passage? You need to repent. That means you need to check your heart. You need to check where your love relationship with Christ is and give that back to him. Go back to the marriage visualization. If, my, if I make my marriage all about me, and I don't focus my love, my attention to my bride, that's not healthy, is it? Jesus has given the church everything it needs. Upon your salvation, he gave you everything you needed. That's what I love about that song. Death was arrested. Oh, death, where is your sting going? Isn't that a freedom we celebrate? Or is it just a song we sing and go, there, I did it? And then Jesus says something interesting because we... He calls out a specific group known as the Nicolaitans. And just so you guys are aware of, because it's just kind of there. There's no elaboration on it. Jesus specifically says he hates the Nicolaitans. You know, anytime somebody says, oh, Jesus is all about love, Jesus loves me. Let's remind you, in scripture it says there are things he hates. And here's what the Nicolaitans were doing. They were an offshoot of a movement called the Gnostic movement which basically believed that the resurrection of Christ was not really a resurrection. He did not come back from the dead. He did not do that. That if he was truly fully God and fully man, he couldn't die. So there was no resurrection because he couldn't die. That's what they were teaching, and that's what was infiltrating churches. And we still see some of that today, believe it or not. So when Jesus says... At least you turned away from those guys. I hate them. He is saying, those who are saying, I didn't even do what I said I did, I do not tolerate. But he makes a, a threat. Not really a threat, because when he says things, he's not meaning it to be shallow. It's a promise. He says, if you don't repent and go back to this, I will remove your lampstand. What does that mean? It's very simple. I will remove your church from my presence. Church, I'm going to make a statement, and this is going to be the scary one. He still removes lampstands today. I'm going to hit a nerve when I say this. If you don't think COVID revealed things, I don't know what will. And nothing against our friends that are at home that have health issues, don't think this is at you, but let's, we got to call out things the way they are. When Scripture spells out the importance of the body and the fellowship gathering together, and we found a reason to drop that, that's a problem. And all these churches are willing to compromise, but Christ clearly spells out that when you do not follow what he calls, your lampstand will be removed from his presence. Church, I don't care if we're down to 40 people. If we're in the presence of Christ, that is enough. But do we believe that? Because what many of us are guilty of, and I've been there, by the way. Yeah, you're hearing it from the preacher, your pastor. He's a human and he screwed up before. Right? My wife just said amen really loud. It got awkward. She thought it was under her breath, but no. Uh, but the fact is, we may love Jesus, but it's not in a healthy place. We say we love Jesus, but Jesus, don't make me go beyond that hour and a half on Sunday. Jesus, don't make me get out of my comfort zone to talk to a stranger. Jesus, don't make me get out of my comfort zone and spend my money to maybe go international on a mission. Jesus, don't make me do these things. You said me an awful lot in a relationship that should be about him. What we do too many times, church, 
is we are quick to say, Jesus, I'm willing to do this. Here's my list of things I'm willing to do for you. And sometimes he is going to call you to something bigger than that. And we're very quick to look at him and say, I love you, but... What was the meatloaf song? I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. <laughs> we laugh. But that is how we interact with him. And Jesus looks at a church, by the way, a successful church. This was not a dying church. This was not a church impacted by COVID. This was the alpha dog at the time. This was the church that people were looking at and going, if we could be like Ephesus. And Jesus says, John, I need you to write something down because they don't got it all figured out. They probably felt pretty good about themselves. And he says, I have this against you. You've lost your first love. You don't love me like you used to. Your passion for me and the hope and your love for people. Remember, the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you've lost that. Thank you for hating the Nicolaitans, but you've lost that. It's a loaded thing that's happening here because we're very quick to, to say, well, what were they talking about then? And people have all these different theories about what losing the first love is. But church, we, can, we make mountains out of molehills when it comes to the Bible at times. We just got to go back and look at the early church and we got to know that Ephesus at one point in time was a church that the pagans didn't mess with. Man, these people are so fired up for the gospel. These people don't care who they share it with because they love Jesus so much and they love people so much that they don't want to see them burn in hell. And church, we don't see that today. We have loved ones who if they took their final breath today, they're separated from God for eternity. And we just go, oh, I hope somebody gets that message to them. If you truly believe in who Jesus is, if you truly believe in the work of the Holy Spirit, guess what you're going to do? You are going to plant the seeds that is the gospel and you're going to let the Holy Spirit do that work. But you have a responsibility and a call. Don't grow cold in your love for Jesus. When you come to worship, that's your time with him. Don't worry about what other people in the pew are doing. Love him so much that it is singing to him. When you read your Bible, don't read it because it's a chore. Read it because it draws you closer into them. And it's an honor and privilege we have. Amen? Don't lose your first love and don't get legalistic. Don't think you have it all figured out. Because let me tell you something. The Christ that went on the cross, he did it for that sinner that's coming in struggling as much as he did for you that thinks you have your act together for decades. And for those of you who say, I, I want to believe, I'm there, but Nate, I struggle. Have you given Christ everything or have you held back? Because church, in those days, the love will grow cold. Jerry Falwell said something. He was talking about, I guess he was back in the day, Phil Donahue. How many of y'all remember Phil Donahue, by the way? Show of hands. Okay. So Jerry Falwell was on Phil Donahue. And um, regardless of your opinions, I thought this was a great story. Phil Donahue went after him and said, you Baptists think that all you guys are going to heaven and everybody else is going to hell. And he said, no, there's Baptists going to hell too. And he made a statement that, church, we have to reflect. He said, orthodoxy on ice is as dangerous as liberalism on fire. It's not what the church has. It's who the church sends out and what the church does when they dismiss after service. Because if you spend more time in a potluck than you do... Teaching the gospel to the lost? Church, that's a country club. That is not a church. My challenge to you is this today. I could go off on a rant all day long. Some of you are like, he's ranting today. No, nah, I'm fired up. I'm preaching. Y'all want revelation. I got it for you. <laughs> but here's what I want you to think about for a minute. 
If Jesus stood before you today, one-on-one, and by the way, what's amazing about when we read Revelation, Jesus didn't look the way his disciples were used to seeing him. He's more glorified. He said his hair is as white as wool. His eyes were like fire. His skin's like bronze. He is Jesus, but not the one that they were used to. In church, you do know that's the Jesus we are going to see one day. And here's my question to you, and it's not a shameful question. If we don't check our hearts frequently, then our relationship with Christ is cold. But I want you to think about this. If Jesus stood before you today, is he going to ask you this question? Is he going to say, where's our love relationship? Is he going to look at you and say, I know you love me, but you've lost your first love. Friend, let me explain something to you about a relationship with Jesus Christ. He never promised you a life of ease when you become his child. You know that, right? He doesn't offer you prosperity. He doesn't offer you ease. What he offers you is what's most important, and that is eternity with him. But you have a, you have a calling. Everybody who professes to be a Christian is called into the mission field. You know that, right? And so many times it, when we first get saved and we're fired up for Jesus, we look around and we go, how can these people believe this and do nothing about it? And we're so excited. And then time goes by, tragedy occurs, the wear and tear of life starts attacking you. And all of a sudden you go, yeah, I love Jesus. Between the hours of 10.30 to noon on Sunday. Or you, you go, well, if I don't have a spiritual experience, he's not real. Seriously? Jesus has very explicit instructions to the church at Ephesus. He looks at them and he says, repent. Repent, meaning you need a renewing of your mind. Remember we talked about that a few weeks ago? The Greek word, mananoia. In English, we know it's a repentance, but it means a renewing of your mind. That means that sin, that struggle you're holding on to, that thing you don't want, you're like, oh, Jesus, I'll get this fixed. Don't you worry. I'll get ready for you when I take care of myself. He's looking at you going, you can't take care of yourself. Or if you could, you don't need a savior. If you could do it on your own, Christ didn't have to go on a cross. And I don't ever want to believe that the cross happened for no reason. So today, church, we're going to enter a time of prayer and worship. And here's what I want you to ask yourself, simply. Have you lost your first love? Is Christ and his gospel, is that your first love or his life kind of caused a misprioritization? Did you replace Jesus with you as the first love? Is your job? Here's the hard one. Is your family ahead of him? Because if he's not out number one, the rest of those things you're going to continue to struggle with. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to pray over you. As you can see, you have no excuse. We've got the kneeling benches up here now. Those of you who need to come to the altar, you come up and you pray and you talk to him. Maybe some of you need to just fully repent, say, clean your heart out and say, Jesus, here is the sin I've been struggling with and holding on to. Take this from me. Give me the strength to stay away from sinful environments. Give me the strength to be more like you. I want you to be my first love. And church, if we can do that collectively as a church, our lampstand will strengthen. You know that, right? We could be a solid lampstand, but if we aren't on our knees crying out to our Savior and loving on people the way Jesus says we need to, the lampstand weakens. And you know what Jesus says he does with those? Removes them. In church, we need him, don't we? We need him every hour of every day. Let me pray over you. Father God, we come to you burdened.
We come to you struggling. We come to you weary. Because so many of us can get caught up in trying to live by our own strength instead of the strength that the Holy Spirit leads us in through. God, I'm praying today that people have their hearts broken for the gospel. That they don't know that they have it all figured out. That they remove that idea. That they just say, you know what? Maybe the way I'm doing it isn't working. And they fully give that to you. They take their mind and they wipe it clean. They dump their hearts out in front of you and say, Jesus, look at all this sin that I've been struggling with, holding on to. And you just simply say, let me put that back together because I make all things new. God, be with our church as we continuously want to grow in strength and knowledge and understanding that we have disciples, not just people who show up and attend classes, that we have disciples for Christ who have a fire for the gospel, who are like the church of Ephesus in the early days, instead of being a church that maybe gets content. Let us never be content, Lord, because the things in the past are there and you make all things new. It's your name we pray, amen. Altars open, church. If you need time to pray to your heavenly Father, do so. Just
Maybe seated. Part two of my sermon. No, I'm kidding. Church, I always want you to remember this. You know, when I was a when I was a football coach, we had a saying. You never stay the same. You either get better or you get worse. Can we all agree to that? You know that's very much like our walk with Jesus. You never just stay in the same place. It's either growing or stepping back. So my encouragement to you today is the greatest gift he has given you is the ability to choose whether or not you grow in him or not. You know that's a gift, right? But a lot of us choose poorly, don't we? Don't let the world beat you up. Don't let the enemy whisper anything in your ear of who Jesus is not. Friend, let me tell you, Jesus is everything. Christ is better. And whatever it is you're struggling with today, give it to him. Lean into him. But here's the, here's the catch. Don't do it alone. You do know the church, the body of believers, we come together to lift each other up, hold each other accountable, love one another. Remember what Jesus said, they will know us by our love. So church, don't forget your first love. And as you go out to the world, when you know you're supposed to have that conversation, when you know that somebody needs Jesus, love Jesus more than yourself and share him with others. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for us having the freedom to come together and worship freely. God, may we never take advantage of that. May we always remember the price that was paid for us to be able to become disciples of Christ. It was Jesus on a cross who paid that debt. And he invites us to, to the table. Even though we're sinful and unworthy, he invites us in. And he reconciles us into himself so that we may go out and share that hope in a broken, sinful world and show people what hope and love truly is. And his name is Jesus. Church, it's in your name we pray. Amen. You are sent. <laughs>